board. Hello and welcome everyone to Journal Club today. Um, today um, we've got a little bit of a different kind of journal club. I'm just going to talk through an, a more anaesthetics paper. However, you know, it is relevant to um, intensive care as well. So today I'm going to talk about um, post-operative pulmonary complications following a non-cardiothoracic surgery. Okay. Okay, I'm just... There we go. Um, so this is the article that I've chosen. Um, as you can see, it was published in June 2017 in the British Journal of Anesthesia. Um, and this is what we're going to talk through today. So why did I choose this paper? So there's a number of reasons. I thought it was an interesting topic when I was looking through the different journal um, articles. And it's a place for us as anaesthetists and intensivists to change um, practice to reduce complications. And these complications are very common in um, patients and can have a, a lot of effect on morbidity, mortality and length of stay. So if we can do things to change things, then that would always be a good you know, start point for us. Um, so the relevance. So it's very important in the 30 day mortality because it you know, affects the long term um, clinical outcomes and can adversely affect them, especially if people are getting a lot of complications. Um, and it's the most common adverse complications that people get after surgery, and they can be as common as cardiac complications. And they're actually more likely to predict the mortality compared to cardiac complications, especially in elderly patients. And as you can see, it is quite a significant amount of people that get these complications. It's 12.5% in elective uh, post-operative patients and 5.8% in um, major abdominal surgery. And actually, it can be even higher in patients who are emergency patients as well. So what is the definition? So the pulmonary abnormalities that result in identifiable disease or dysfunction and adversely affect the patient's clinical outcome. So what exactly am I talking about here? Uh, and this is the pulmonary um, complications. So I'm talking about atelectasis, um, pneumonias, obviously um, respiratory failure, type one and type two, um, pleural effusions, pneumothorax, aspir aspiration pneumonitis, uh, and bronchospasm. So all of these are very important pulmonary complications that patients can get after surgery. And we as anaesthetists and uh, intensivists can do things to change and reduce the risk of these kind of things happening. Okay, so there's a few risk factors for, for patient uh, demographic who would get this kind of um, complications at a higher risk. Um, having a, a, an older population um, is important. Having an ASA greater than two, is also important. Um, the functional dependency is talking about their functional status um, pre and perioperatively. Having existing comorbidities, most importantly, um, congestive cardiac failure and COPD. And of course, smoking is very important and um, smokers are at higher risk for these complications postoperatively. Um, most of these things obviously are um, patient specific and they're not things that we can change but we can optimize them and the way that we optimize them is looking at them preoperatively and thinking are there things that we can change for these patients especially in the elective population okay so increasing age is one of the most important risk factors um, and it's postulated that it may be due to the lack of a physiological reserve for these patients um, higher airway closing capacity and lower ventilation perfusion ratios and so they're more likely to be hypoxic and therefore um, suffer from these pulmonary complications postoperatively. The ASA is very important because um, it predicts um, these complications and if patients are more dependent, um, so for example they have a B, uh, four times daily carers, then they have a much higher likelihood of developing a pneumonia. And you can see the odds ratio there. Um, and having a chronic condition, such as congestive heart failure, COPD and renal failure, they're all, um, all associated with pulmonary complications, most importantly of these um, being pneumonia. And smoking is one of the most important risk factors that we as doctors can change um, and the reason for this is because smokers have a six um, times increase risk of um, having these pulmonary complications compared to people who have never smoked. Um, and so 
there is a much smaller increase of risk for people that have been smoking within one year of their surgery. So if we see patients um, preoperatively and they smoke, it might be a good idea to, to, give, to give them some counseling about um, smoking cessation. Of course, you know, in the short term, if you stop smoking within about six weeks of surgery, this can actually um, lead to more airway inflammation. But in the long term, it is of benefit for patients um, in terms of um, reducing their risk of complications. Um, looking at investigations as well, so um, as you can see on the slide here, having these um, changes, so having a low haemoglobin, a low saturation, high urea, high creatinine, um, and a low albumin, these are all indicators for chronic diseases, and so some of these we can optimise, so make sure that they're well um, hydrated uh, in terms of their renal function, making sure that their medicines are optimised, if they need uh, iron iron tablets or iron transfusion or even blood transfusion, making that sure the HB is optimized preoperatively, that might be useful. You know, we, we normally do chest x-rays. They're not as useful um, because they don't actually tell you about like the, um, the capacity um, and any of the measurements for lung um, there. So spirometry is actually more useful, but I can understand it's a lot more difficult to get um, spirometry done but it, it is beneficial for patients just to optimize them preoperatively. Okay, other things, you know, that are going to affect um, the, the, the risk of having these complications is having a prolonged surgery. Again, this is not something that we can change because sometimes um, surgeries are difficult and so they're going to take longer. Um, depending on the surgical site, again, not something that we can change. An emergency surgery, which of course, you know, is not something that we can't, we can change. Um, so what can we actually do? So intraoperatively, we can use a minimally invasive surgery. So we can ask the surgeon if they can do the procedure laparoscopically. This might not always be um, able, possible because of the difficulty in surgery. But of course, if we can try to do that first, that would be beneficial for the patient. Um, we can use a lung protective mode of ventilation and what I mean by that is using um, a six to eight mil per kilo um, kind of tidal volume um, if we can and actually adding a little bit of PEEP between six to eight centimeters of water can help um, to reduce the risk of um, atelectasis and reduce the risk of um, pneumonia postoperatively. We can try a neuraxial blockade, okay, so for example having a spinal epidural in, in surgery um, because postoperatively, this will allow patients to breathe um, much easier and better because they actually, on average, have a better pain control rather than um, opiate alone. The use of volatiles as well during surgery can be beneficial. Um, most of uh, volatiles that we use at the moment, such as acevofluorine, are actually bronchodilators. Um, the only one that's exception is desfluorine. Using a supraglottic airway device in a suitable patient can be better than using an endotracheal tube because we don't have the, the risk of uh, airway irritation and such like that. But of course, it depends on the surgery. Some surgeries need to be done on uh, an endotracheal tube. Um, having a goal-directed fluid therapy instead of just um, flooding patients with um, fluid is always better. And actually monitoring their neuromuscular um, neuromuscular junction is important as well, especially when using neuromuscular blocking agents. And postoperatively, I mean, this is more what we can do in the intensive care, making sure that we mobilize the patient early, so not allowing them to stay in the bed all day, if we can get them to, to move with the physios, go out into the chair, sit out in the chair as long as they can, having effective analgesia. And as I um, alluded to earlier, an epidural for a big abdominal surgery can be better in terms of pain relief than IV opioids because it actually um, takes away the pain if it's cited correctly. However, of course, there is always uh, um, risks with um, introducing epidurals and also they don't always work as they are meant to. Um, having lung expansion and techniques and chest physio is very important for these patients, okay, making sure that their pain is well controlled and that they can breathe um, adequately. In our unit, I think we also have um, some special um, lung, um, like they've got um, machines which they can use to try and expand their lungs. Um, and it's like a peak flow 
um, meter, but specifically for physiotherapy. So that's always good as well. So the key points that I wanted to, uh, to, to say from this paper is that we need to do a, a three-pronged approach, look at the pre-operative strategies for optimizing um, cardiovascular disease, um, stopping patients from smoking early and rehabilitate, prehabilitation exercise programs. Um, intraoperatively, we, we can try and reduce the, the length of surgery, um, monitor the neuromuscular blocking agents and not use too much of them. And the way we can do that is having um, neuromuscular, uh, like a twitch sensor to check that, and a lung protective modes of ventilation, six to eight mils per kilo, as we do in the intensive care unit as well. And then post-operative strategies is to make sure uh, the analgesia is um, well, um, like it's good for the patients, encouraging patients to use their analgesia because a lot of the, the older patients, they don't want to use the analgesia. They don't understand how important it is for them to be able to breathe properly. Um, um, early mobilization, encouraging patients to go and sit in the chair if we can, and lung expansion techniques. And that's where we can, as intensive care unit, um, work to improve um, and reduce the risk of these pulmonary complications in patients. Um, so the critical appraisal. Um, in, this, in this article, they didn't really explain how they did the list literature um, search strategy. Um, they had a good number of references. Um, um, some were systematic reviews, etc., which is a good quality of evidence, I thought. Um, the endpoint has a strength uh, of ed evidence assigned to it, but it's not clear how this rating was achieved. Um, and the, some of the strategies that they've discussed in this paper are not under our control as anaesthetists, like the length of surgery. But of course, some of them are, are under our control, like which mode of analgesia we decide for the patient, depending on the surgery. And finally, I thought this paper was good. However, a lot of the strategies that they um, discussed were very well-known strategies. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Does anyone have any questions for me about anything? Anyone have any questions? No. No questions. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'll just...